Welcome to Road to Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. To celebrate and do a countdown to a very exciting game, today we are talking about a recurring enemy and entity of the series that is heavily linked to the FF7 universe in particular. We are talking about the weapons. When you talk about the weapons in Final Fantasy, we are not talking about your normal blades and tools for combat but rather about specific creatures that stand out above the rest, for the particularity of being some of the toughest bosses in the respective games. The reason for this topic to be a Final Fantasy VII themed one is because it's since this game that the existence of weapons that matches the style and design based on the famous mechas from the Gundam series started to be more common in later games. As here, in the international version, we got probably the two most well-known super bosses in the series, the Emerald Weapon and the Ruby Weapon. And the reason to make it Final Fantasy VII Rebirth related is because these particular scenes and dialogue in the trailers shown so Two far. Two creatures, said only to appear when the planet is in grave danger. Which hints their appearance at this point in the story. Still to know how and when. Or which one. So let's talk about all the weapons that exist and are common so far. Ultima Weapon is what I would consider the main one. It might not be the one you have in your head immediately when thinking about the iconic super bosses of FF7, but it's the one with more history in the franchise. So much that it's not even its first appearance the one in 7, as it appeared in its first version in Final Fantasy VI, looking completely different to what eventually they will be, and with its name, Atma Weapon. If you can put a little bit of localization deduction here, you realize what Atma really means to be, as it's called Ultima Weapon in its original name. As its first time, Ultima Weapon will be Kefka's pet, the strongest boss to fight before the World of Balance is destroyed as it guards the Warring Triad at the Floating Continent. In terms of looks, it resembles more a magical behemoth type of monster, surrounded by flames from its mouth and with the ability to cast powerful magic like Flare, which is also common for the behemoths. And while it might look different to the rest, it does have a background that is going to be a common thing about the weapons. It was created a thousand years ago, during the War of the Magi, and was bred for the purpose of mass destruction, hence its name. In Final Fantasy VII, we start to see the type of design we are more used to. Draconic looking, with four legs, two arms, wings, and a long tail and neck. In this world, Weapons are biomechanical monsters that resemble a kaiju created by the planet appearing when they feel it's in danger, reducing everything to nothingness and mostly targeting what they consider a threat, like it tends to be the case with Genova or the Mako reactors or cannon. And in particular, they roam around the world once Meteor is summoned by Sephiroth from the northern crater. We can see Ultima Weapon firstly at Medil, causing the destruction of the town, not before attempting to fight it but with no successful result, as it flies away after some moments. And since then, it's going to rest at this point of the map and will become an air chase, as it's going to be flying around the world and we can get to it with our own airship, the High Wind, to engage in a couple of fights once it stops flying. It has the particularity that it can be a battle that happens in the sky, while the party stands at the High Wind while fighting, similar to one with Death Case in Final Fantasy VI, and upon its defeat, there's two things to highlight. First is the reward of Cloud's ultimate weapon, called very fittingly, Ultima Weapon. And the second one is that it unlocks a new area near Cosmo Canyon called the Ancient Forest, a small type of maze where you can find things like the Summon Typhoon or the weapon Apocalypse for Cloud. One thing to notice is also that it's the only weapon of the game that you are able to fully fight and beat in the original first version of this game because others we are going to mention later have cinematic moments, and Ruby and Emerald appeared in the international version, which can be a sign that this is considered the main weapon of the series. Final Fantasy VIII will take and carry the idea of this type of weapons to be super bosses in the game, as Ultima Weapon will appear here at the bottom of the Deep Sea Research Center as one of them. Visually speaking, we immediately notice the resemblance with its predecessor, not only because the combination of four legs, two arms, wings and a long tail, but also because of this cute detail that is holding a sword very similar looking to the one you obtained for Cloud in the previous game, making the callback even stronger. 
While fighting this beast, more than a reward, it has the game's most powerful guardian force to draw, so you must actively attempt to get it. What is different though, is that this is a super boss hidden in a small dungeon that also serves as a big challenge, and there's no real story connection or cutscenes to go along with it. But even then, it starts its own trend that is going to be repeated later, and it's about its connection to Omega Weapon. Speaking of which, in Final Fantasy X we are going to have a 4 leg 2 arm monster named Ultima Weapon 2. It's going to be a boss fight, and it's going to be at an optional dungeon of the game called Omega Ruins. And its existence is the byproduct of Omega Weapon's hatred for Yevon and its punishment. As such is the connection we mentioned FF8 started. There's a pretty nice touch with this weapon in its sequel, Final Fantasy X-2, and that is its description in its bestiary, where you can read A mighty fiend of legend, wielding greater magic than ever. This terror teaches all who approach the true meaning of Ultima. Whatever you do, don't call it Atma. The MMORPGs of any franchise potentially are the absolutely perfect place to make a reference fest from the most obscure ones to the ones that cannot be missing, especially if they are already common in every game. So it's reasonable to find Ultima Weapon as part of the Final Fantasy XI world, the first MMO of the series. Here it will appear as a boss in the Chains of Promathia expansion, as part of the main storyline, classified as biotechnological weapons. The difference here is that, while still remaining with that traditional background of being the pinnacle of ancient technological weaponry, it looks completely different than any other incarnation, appearing as a floating, almost insectoid machine. Maybe only the floating upper torso has some sort of similarity, and we can theorize about it later. The second MMO of the series will follow its steps and of course add the weapons among many other traditional and iconic Final Fantasy entities. In this case, Ultima Weapon takes a predominant role in the lore and main plot of Erren Reborn, which can be the expansion that restarted the game. This is a biotechnological, anti-primal war machine created by the Alagan civilization ages ago and was placed in stasis, and later discovered by the Kalian Empire, especially used by Gaius van Velsar, who uses it to absorb the primals, making its first showcase against Ifrit, Titan and Garuda to assimilate their abilities. So the Empire intends to use it as a way to intimidate the city-states of Orsia and the beast tribes that worship such primals. So one of the big moments and missions of the game will be to take down Gaius and its weapon at the Praetorium, the final dungeon of the main scenario storyline, giving this weapon a big role in the game. Of course, many other things will happen involving different people, and with every new expansion some more details are added, but one in particular is how one prototype of the Ultima weapon found in one of these new dungeons is the Ultima Beast that references the original version of FF6. Might as well talk about Omega now, because there was a clear connection with Ultima in many games mentioned, so it's fitting. It all started in Final Fantasy VIII, where there was an even more powerful super boss in the game, and that was of course Omega Weapon, found at Ultimatia's castle, the final dungeon in the game, more specifically at the church of it. A vortex appears in the chapel, and upon ringing a bell outside the art gallery, you are given a time limit to rush to the vortex and challenge it. This would provide you the biggest challenge of the game, with its over a million HP, if you have the desire to prove yourself and accomplish a full run of this game. One thing I wanted to mention before moving on to another game, is that the GBA version of Final Fantasy VI added many new stuff, and among that, there's one dungeon and powerful boss added to it that is the Omega Weapon, which is of course an enhanced version of the Ultima Weapon that we mentioned before. So it's a retroactively connection there too. Speaking of retroactively adding things, while FF7 is known for its weapons, Omega wasn't one of them, but it exists in this world to take the livestream away and leave the planet to die, but as it appeared only in Dirge of Cerberus, I leave it as a special mention as we move on to Final Fantasy X. It seems we rate his personal Here Omega now. Weapon is given a bigger backstory. While still being a super boss of the game, Omega was originally a monk from Yevon, who was branded as a traitor centuries ago unexecuted, so his spirit roamed around the dungeon known as Omega Ruins, where his hatred for Yevon grew so strong that during his death he spawned the creation of Ultima Weapon previously mentioned, while his own spirit ultimately became Omega Weapon itself, being a stronger version of the other one. 
In Gen 2, the roles reversed in terms of power, as Ultima became a powerful boss in a couple of dungeons, while Omega is a weaker version of itself and a regular enemy encounter in the far plane. It's good to mention that Gen 2, as a direct sequel, uses many models of the previous game and gives them different roles, in a similar way to how Majora Mask and Ocarina of Time worked, for example. And in Final Fantasy XI, we have a very unique case. If you think about Omega in Final Fantasy, you'd probably think more of the war mech that is a super boss in games like Final Fantasy V, XII or XV, more than the weapon itself. That's why this game version of what is referred to as Omega Weapon resembles more that machine than the biological weapon we've been talking about so far. So it can be a little bit odd to include it here, as other than the name, it's more of the other enemy. But we can see one little detail to mention. First of all, this enemy was added as a notorious enemy at the same time as Ultima. And if you combine the four-legged machine with the floating body that is Ultima, it resembles the traditional design. Uh, kinda? It's certainly a combination of callbacks. Now for the more FF7-centric ones, we have first Diamond Weapon. I start with this one because it's the other mandatory fight of the main story, and included in the first version of the game. Although with a similar situation than Ultima, you don't fight it until you defeat it, but until you reach a certain point in the fight. Granted, this takes much longer than the Ultima fight at mid and is more challenging as any other boss really. The only different thing is that you are not the one to destroy it fully, as once the fight finishes and climb up into the airship the High Wind, Diamond Weapon, who awoke from the sea to aim at Midgar, probably sensing danger to the planet as the Mako cannon was moved and getting prepared to fire there, attempted to raid the city, and while we do our best to stop it slightly, it was Rufus Shinra's orders to shoot this cannon that eventually drilled a hole in its chest, ending with its life. Before that, Diamond got to launch a couple of shots of its own, with its big shoulder pads, once which landed into the Shinra headquarters themselves, and presumably managed to kill Rufus in the process too as the company directory had to react to this emergency and change of plans and leadership right after. We mentioned before that the designs of the weapons in Final Fantasy VII are highly reminiscent of the mechas from the Gundam franchise. The Diamond Weapon, in particular, is based on the AMX-004 Kubelay. Diamond will have its comeback two times in the franchise. The first one being in Final Fantasy XV and later in Final Fantasy XIV, which I know, it sounds pretty counterintuitive. Thing is, in XIV was added in a later expansion, while in the Final Fantasy XV universe we are able to see this colossal mass destruction weapon used and seen mainly during the invasion of Niflheim to the capital of Insomnia, after betraying any peace treaty. This moment will be located at the end of the first chapter of the game and is first shown in the 2016 movie Kingsclave. This weapon is a colossal Magitek monster created by Berstel, an armor powered by these Magitek cores deployed to terrorize Lucis, and with a very traditional and faithful design to the one shown in Seven, looking better and more menacing than ever. As someone who loves to use his imagination while playing games with some older graphics, that's how imposing I imagine the weapons to be while fighting or interacting with them. I think it's the perfect display of them here. Now back to Final Fantasy XIV, we have the dungeon or trial called the Cloud Deck, added in patch 5.5 during the Shadowbringers expansion, which was not so long ago. A trial that will present a climactic mid-air confrontation with the diamond weapon itself as a boss. Here, it was a Guardian War Machina, created as part of reverse engineering from the Ultima weapon itself, which allowed for many of these to make an appearance in 14, as we'll see later. Here we also have a faithful representation of the Kaishu mecha enemy we are familiar with, the traditional shoulder pads where it launches its attacks, and the silver color palette. Now the one I consider to be the most recognizable super boss of Final Fantasy VII, added in the international version, Emerald Weapon. As we mentioned before, all of these were awakened once Meteor is summoned at the start of Disc 2, and while we see many during the main story plotline, some of them are lingering around slightly hidden in the world, in the case of Emerald Weapon, in the ocean between the two main continents, and not only is menacing swimming there, but also while being the hardest fight in the game, 
it has the feature of having a time limit because of being underwater, so the strategy of stalling and surviving as priority is not going to help, unless you get to obtain, and know where it is, the underwater material to breathe properly. Defeating this planet's protector will give you as reward the Earth Harp item, that by giving it to the old traveler at Calm, in exchange you'll get a full set of master materia, which allows you to cast every spell in the game basically. In terms of design, as you'd expect, Emerald is colored green, and it resembles, from the Gundam franchise, the AMX-002 new seal. Heavy armor, with eyes in its big pauldron, that has more stylish looks than the ones from Diamond Weapon. Besides having a small easter egg in Crisis Core or the remake itself, which of course it's the same universe, we can find Emerald Weapon once again in Final Fantasy XIV, as again, in the same fashion as Diamond and all the others, this is a Guardian War Machina created by reverse engineering the Ultima weapon, with its specific features and upgrades. You can fight it at the Trial Castrum Marinum from the Shadowbringers patch 5.4, where as a nice nod to the original, this very faithful machine has escaped by sea to an Imperial installation, where you go to face off against it and its floating manipulators, on top of the always threatening Poltron eyes. These called manipulators are floating hands surrounding the weapon, and you could say that's the brand new feature that the boss of these games adds to it. The other big one from the Super Boss Duo is Ruby Weapon. This red colored creature has the same role as Emerald. They are hidden somewhere in the world after the Meteor Summon. In its case, it is slightly hidden in the desert, where we can see its head stand out a little bit. And if you get closer to it, we'll get the not so pleasant surprise that there was a huge body hiding underneath. Some characteristics we can notice from Ruby it's its long, almost lizard-like neck and head, and long stretchy arms. This is a very gimmicky fight. As a couple of tentacles, also controlled by it, will get behind you at some point to mess up the fight, turning it into a pincer one. But also there are some properties that it will only do this if there's only one party member alive. So chances are that in this back and forth, one of the party members get yeeted mid-fight. So things can get tricky and silly if you don't know the appropriate way to challenge it. It's also based on the Gundam mecha MSM-03C, Highgog, and its stretchy arms. Defeating it will grant you with the item the Desert Rose, which again can be traded with the Old Man Traveler from Kong, in exchange of a gold chocobo, which allows you to go to every place in the map that not even the airship is able to go, including running on water. And with that there's also another reward, because getting this chocobo also means reaching Round Island, host of the most powerful summon in the game, Knights of the Round. Certainly helpful if you attempt Emerald after this. And in Final Fantasy XIV, Ruby was also part of the weapon's bosses that comes with the Shadowbringer expansion. In this case, thanks to the dungeon in the patch 5.2, Cinder Drift. As you may expect, this is a big Guardian War Machina created, developed and reformed from reverse engineering Ultima Weapon and incorporating the data of their leader, Nel Vandarnus, into the mainframe. A little bit more of lore added into it, but that classic background remains. As the first one introduced, during the trial this was established as Ultima successor developed secretly, and the mission is to take it down first, and later finishing off its pilot Nell. We can see that this anti-icon machina has the lizard-like face of its original version, while looking more armored, especially in its shoulder, closer to the original Gundam. And also, whatever is happening here? And the last one from the main group of Final Fantasy VII, we have Sapphire Weapon, the first one we see in action in the main plotline, arriving and attacking Junon as soon as Tifa wakes up a week later after the meteor is summoned. Probably the reason to attack this place is that the big cannon that attempts to hurt the planet, or at least has the potential to do so, is here. Sapphire is not a boss fight in the game, as everything that happens with it is purely cinematic. It's the first showcase of the weapons interacting with the world now that they have awakened, and it's quite destructive. Unfortunately for it, it doesn't end well, as while it seems that it is able to damage the city and ignore any attempts that the Shinra army tries to slow it down, it's the cannon itself that perfectly positioned blow its heads off, ending with its life. In terms of looks, besides the obvious blue color, it's similar to the Manta Ray, as it's an aquatic weapon with grave movement in it, and based on the Gundam, many letters, Dogorla with its big torso and long tail. 
Sapphire will also be the last one included for the Shadowbringer bosses for Final Fantasy XIV, as it's formally introduced in patch 5.3 during a water battle during the mission Sleep Now in Sapphire. After defeating Sapphire Weapon, the player can receive a decorative bust of the weapon from Garland Ironworks to display in their home. Similarly to how it's not a proper fight in Final Fantasy VII, in this game it's also not the boss from a raid specifically, as it was the case with the others, although you still fight it in a different way to the conventional one. I didn't mention the background, but you'd be surprised to know that this weapon in this game comes from reverse engineering the Ultima weapon and incorporating new data to be like that. Can you believe that? Although it has the unique detail of having the data of an aquatic primal and from regular Van Hytrus into its mainframe too, so that's specific to it. And finally, there's one more surprising appearance of Sapphire in the series, and it is also in Final Fantasy XV. While it doesn't have the big and cool showcase that Diamond did, it is mentioned in Luna Freya's chapter, which is part of what would have been the cancelled second part of the DLC, therefore we weren't able to see it. Apparently, it could be the final boss of it, as it's similar to the Diamond Weapon background, a Magitek armor hidden away in ancient Solheim ruins, and with the power of demons and Magitek, this entity could wake up and start the fight. So that's all the history of the big Kaishu Gundam-like creatures of Final Fantasy known as weapons. The reason for us to talk about this once again is that as Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is getting closer, as we celebrate Final Fantasy VII anniversary, the little bits of the trailers hinted us that we'd very well be able to see one of these, and even new ones, as they're still mysteries. We don't know if this moment is one where Tifa is able to meet one of them for the first time, Maybe the conversation that happens in the back is about a moment prior to it, or after it happened, or unrelated. Maybe when she falls here is when she is able to meet it, or maybe she falls into its big ball of life stream it seems to have. Or maybe it's an old weapon like Sapphire, but remodeled. I know that games like Before Crisis and Dares of Cerberus added their own new ones, so it can be the case here too. In fact, many questions for a simple 5 second moment that we know it has some deep background in the history of the original game and franchise. So that to me is exciting, that we are presented with brand new information of very familiar things, and until it's out, it remains a mystery the role on it. So until Rebirth comes out next February 29, thank you very much for watching, enjoy some Final Fantasy VII Remake, and I'll see you later. Love you.